We're here today, first town centre on the Codbeck, and uh, that's a nice way to start, a lovely little day. Let's see how we get on. As I said in the intro, we're on uh, the Codbeck, Thirsk, and uh, I'm not exactly in the town centre, but we're uh, just on a peg in the play park, just out of town. We've got dog walkers up and down, and uh, as Chappie will probably show you, I've got this little play park behind us. Real nice area to be. Um, the Codbeck is a tributary of the swale, which, um, as you know, we've fished a few times on uh, Cadence Fishing TV, done a few videos on there. So we've just come here today. It's middle of January. We've had a frost overnight, but uh, the rivers are out of condition really. So we we come here today just to just to see what we can catch and. Uh, There'll be situations where you'll be in little towns and places like that where you've got streams and small rivers running through. There's, there's one at York that, that's similar to this, the Foss. But uh, I was brought up round here. I, I cut my teeth fishing on this river, uh, just fishing with a little six foot rod as a kid catching little dace and little chublets, I remember it well. So uh, it's bringing back a few memories for me. And um, it belongs to Thirsk Angling Club and we'll show you details of that at the end of the video. It's got all sorts in here, trout, grayling, chub. We've even had the odd barbel from time to time. And I've heard stories of all sorts of fish. There's certain areas through town a bit lower down than this where you can catch some decent chub and we might have a look at them later on if we get the chance. Years ago, and I mean years ago, probably 30 years now, I used to uh, fish matches for Thirsk Angling Club. We used to fish the Northeast Winter League on the Tyne, uh, the Tees should I say, and the Squale and Roundabout and uh, Come the winter months, when the rivers were out of condition, we used to run little knock-ups on here. And uh, obviously well attended, because the matches were off. And we've had some really good weights. So, uh, Thirsk Angling Club ceased some years ago, and uh, it's now reformed again, thanks to hard work and endeavor by uh, Stuart Tate and uh, and a few others. It was Stuart's local to the village, to the town, and uh, he's resurrected the club again. And uh, he's also resurrected the little matches. So Thirsk Angling Club now run matches in winter on on the Codbeck, and you get a decent attendance, 15 to 20 fish. And uh, so. That's one of the reasons I've come back really. It's just really nostalgic for me and uh, I had forgotten how, how good it can be here. We, we get weights on here. I mean, there's been some big weights, but normally you would expect framing weight will be double figures, 10, 15 pound of these, of these days on when the conditions are right. It's, uh, it's not exactly the why, and in their town centre, uh, 100 pound weights, but it's a really enjoyable place to come and fish. And uh, it's just a pity we couldn't bring James here today for a little knock up, but uh, obviously he's frightened of losing his pound, but we'll, go, we'll, we'll have another go at that later on sometime. 
Yeah, the uh, situation around here, the, you know, with the young anglers especially, those that uh, don't get chance to fish rivers, they're really all commercial. This would be a great place to learn how to put a stick float through and, uh, and fish running water and maybe drum up a bit of interest with those juniors. So uh, if you're local to the place, and, and if there's a stream near you and a river, same thing, take, take the young ones out and show them how to put a float through. I'm sure they'll enjoy it as I did when I was younger. It's surprising what you can catch in these small rivers and streams around towns. We had a few nice days and my first little chublet. Although I've brought quite a bit of gear with me and I, and I just can't resist it, really when you come into places like this, all you need is, especially on the, on the smaller rivers, is just a nice little short float rod couple of floats with you, nice and light, bit of shot, landing net, bit of bait, bait apron, and, uh, and away you go. You can roam about, trying different pegs and uh, different swims. We're gonna do that later on, I think. We'll have a wander down and uh, we'll show exactly what I mean. But uh, the beauty of it is you hardly need anything at all. When I used to come as a kid, I used to come on my push bike and I just had the one rod, a tub of maggots and, uh, and that was it, a few little bits and pieces in a bag. You need next to nothing. It's really simple fishing and, uh, and a great way to try and master running water, learn how to control a float and the rest of it. Because uh, it's not the easiest of fishing, stick float fishing, if you've never done it before, but uh, it can be mastered on places like this, the ideal place to learn. My first real fishing rod was, um, I think it was either, I think it was seven foot, it might have been seven foot, and it was fiberglass and it had brass ferrule on it. I remember it well. Um, I don't know whether, I can't remember whether it was three piece or two piece. No, I would imagine two piece. And uh, I remember, my mum taking me to Borough Bridge and uh, I saw this reel, it was a, I'm sure it was green and I, it was a French and it was called Crack or something like that. I'd, uh, something like that, a close face reel, it was absolutely brilliant for what I was doing. And uh, it stopped me getting entangled that reel, I remember it well and I caught loads of fish on that. Many happy fishing trips with that nice little fiberglass rod. And by total contrast to uh, how I started on the rivers with that fiberglass rod and that, and that French reel, today all the modern equipment we've got and especially the rod I'm using today, which the one I'm using at the moment is uh, the 11 foot match number one. Really soft, perfect for these Dace and these situations uh, and I've coupled that with a 3000 reel and it's absolutely ideal combination. The other rod I've got with me uh, is, the, is the next step up, it's the match two, still 11 foot because that's what you want for little places like this, nothing too big. The shorter rod means you can accurately cast under little bushes and trees and things like that, the far bank. It's a lot easier to use in little tight spaces like this. 
And line control's pretty good. It's pretty straightforward, really. So uh, you don't have to worry about that. Lovely quality grilling. Right, we're going to take a break from the fishing at the moment because it's slowed down. And as you can probably see, it's sun's in my eyes. I can't see the floor anyway. So we might, we might uh, just move pegs in a minute just until that disappears. But uh, that's going to give us the opportunity to show you what I'm using, the rigs and uh, talk you through that a bit so let's have a look right uh, as we said before rod i'm using our cr10 11 foot match one that's what i'm using at the moment and uh, i do have a match two but i'll show you that one in a moment as far as uh, the rig goes it's pretty simple really i'll just put this rod rest around so we can Rest it on there. I'm setting off float wise with a, a pin stick that uh, sort of made myself and I'm having some of these professionally made anyway because they work really well. It just takes three number eight. It's got uh, an 08 wire stem in it which gives us pretty much instant control, it cocks straight away. And the beauty about these floats, uh, this type of float, is uh, when you're fishing shallow waters and you strike, they don't make a, a noise in the water, they don't splash, they don't loop over. So you can get away without spooking those uh, dace and chub in those shallow swims. So today we're fishing depth wise probably two and a half, three foot, which is tripping the bottom actually on this swim we're in. And, uh, and that'll be the case in a lot of these shallow streams and rivers that you fish around towns. This one is uh, very simply shotted up with three number eight. And uh, I've got one that was actually set, that one set to the depth I'm fishing as you can see there, between the bottom of the float and the shot, that's how much over depth I'm fishing, probably three inches. So uh, you've got uh, one shot, which I uh, sit at the bottom of the float for a depth marker. Halfway down, another number eight. And then I'll just tighten that up so you can get a better look. Oops. And our last number eight, is on top of a six inch hook length and uh, at the moment you can see it's a bit of a delicate hook is this one it's a size 22 b511 camasan b511 on an 08 hook length and i'm fishing really light at the moment because to be fair we're struggling for bites today but uh, normally on here i'd be using an 010 and an 18 B560 is, uh, is my go-to hook when I'm fishing for days. So that sums up that rig. My real line, by the way, is uh, Dave Harrell 014, which is a really good line, floating line. I've got uh, the other rod that we briefly discussed, and that's the CR10 11 foot match 2. I've got exactly the same float on. But uh, this is the rigger I was going to use when we start bagging up. And this is same again. Three number eight pin stick. Got a nice dome top on so I can see it at distance. But this is shotted with number 10s. You can see one's 
one shot just below, just as my depth marker, once I've plumbed the depth. And then you go down, we've got one, two, three, four, five number tens. And again, that's sat on top of a six inch hook length. And this is my normal rig, which is O10 to a size 18 B560 hook. And uh, same again, Dave Arrell's O14 Pro Match line. The perfect combination. The reel, as we discussed before, is, is the uh, is the 3000 model. So that's what I tend to use on those short rods. That's the uh, the hooks we use. The B560 size 18 is uh, is my go-to on that single caster or double maggot. Works perfectly on those. My hook length is Sil Star Match Team. I've used this for years. I keep trying different stuff. But I always go back to that. Strong as you like, I use O12 and O14 if I'm chub fishing, but for the days it's O10. And as we said on, on the lighter rod, I've got O8 today because we are struggling for bites at the moment. So that sums up what we're doing there. And uh, if the sun allows us, I'll try and demonstrate now how to actually present your uh, stick float and how to fish it, how to cast, give you some idea of uh, how to approach uh, moving water like this. Right, I'm going to now show you. Uh, I'm going to now show you how uh, how I go about casting out, and for benefits, especially for those who. I've not even tried stick float fishing and, and the less experienced anglers, I'll demonstrate just how I do it. And uh, what I do is I'm gripping the uh, hook length just an inch or so above the hook. And hopefully that's going to avoid piercing my fingers with that hook. I have done it now and again, but uh, as, as you'll see when we demonstrate this, it's, uh, it's not the end of the world if you do that, you're not embedding the hook. Anyway, what we do is, I'm right-handed, so I'll explain it as a right-handed person. We put in a little tension on the line, not too much, just enough to keep, keep it all in, in line and, and uh, give you some way of flicking that uh, float out when we come to the end of our sweeping action. So we're moving the, the rod to the left. I've undone the bail arm, as you can see, I've got my finger on the spool. And then the idea is we uh, cast out and when the rod gets to where you want to stop or really where you're aiming to land your float at, that's when we let go of the float. So we sweep out, cast, let go. And then just before the float hits the water, we put in the finger on the spool to stop the line and then we're sweeping back towards ourselves and that makes the float run out and all the the shot and the line and the hook length all land in a straight line and absolutely spot on to where you want to cast it's not a method that you can cast 30 40 yards with it's just for fishing a rod and a half out maybe two rods out and We've just hooked a fish now while I was demonstrating that. And I've, I'm using the number one, as you can see. Absolutely brilliant for this. The, the action of the rod, so soft. I don't know what we've got, but it's quite a decent one. And bear in mind, I'm fishing an 08 hook length on here. And I don't know whether Chappie can catch a bend in that rod. But you, you don't have a problem breaking off or smashing off with the fish. Unfortunately for us, we've got a fish that doesn't count. It's out of season, it's a trout, so. It's at least it's demonstrating the action of that rod. It's jagging away there. There we go. Unfortunately, the dark count will pull him back. He can get onto 
do what he does best this time of year. Right, once you've mastered the cast, you need to try and uh, master the line control. And it is pretty straightforward, really. What you've got to try and do is get the line directly behind the float all the time. And uh, I'm going to purposely now, if Chappie can catch it, let us get a bow in the line and I'm going to show you how to mend it. The float's running down, you can see, possibly see it's running a bit awkward now. That's because we've got a bow. So what we do is we lift the line up, rotate the rod and lay it flat back on the water again, the line. I lost my concentration there because we had a little bite. But, um, so we'll go through that again. Cast out. It's actually quite, the peg I'm fishing is quite easy to fish really because uh, we've got slack water in front of us. So that's helping us with line control anyway. But um, I'm going to show you now. We've got a bit of a bow in the line purposely doing that and we're pointing the rod towards the float we lift the line up lay it flat and then let release the line and let it go now it's directly behind the float and i can trap the line on the spool and just ease that float through so i can control it this particularly works well with roach so you can hold the float back Control it just how you want it to try and entice a bite. Right, I'll just uh, give you a, a quick uh, description of setting up the float. As you can see on here, I've got um, this pin stick like we talked about earlier. I paint mine uh, yellow. I, can, I tend to be able to see the yellow tops in most water conditions, most light conditions. And, and today it's, it's perfect as a yellow top because we've got shadow under the far bank there where the trees give us cover. So yellow works for me, you can have them red, you can black them out if you're on shiny water. But um, the most important thing for me when we're doing this type of fishing is uh, the wire stem. It stabilises the float it gives you a little bit of weight, so when you're trying to correct your line behind the float, it's not pulling it too much offline, even though it's a very light float, which we need for these conditions. I've got that attached, top, bottom and middle, really. And um, we've got a, the bigger band on the top, because it's a wider top, obviously. And uh, all, I've, all I've got on these, I just buy silicon tube in lens. You can buy that. Um, and I'll show you some, I get that from Dave Harrell as well when I buy on his online store. We've got, um, I'll just pull the silicon off so you can see. We attach the wire, or I attach it, with two pieces of the silicon tubing. <clears throat> and I slide one up to the bottom of, of where the, uh, the body of the float is. And then the other one, and you notice they're quite long as well. You notice we just push that onto the wire. Move that up. And with this one, I like to keep it, if I just bend that, you'll see. I like to keep it um, below the stem. It just avoids tangles. So you've got most of the tube onto the stem and just a tiny bit just below, loose, so it just avoids tangles. And the, the idea behind the centre one is if, is if that should ever break or come free, you can't, uh, uh, and tear like it sometimes does in the emergency, that one can be moved down. But it does help keep the line real tidy and neat against your float. And that's how we set the float up. We'll just slide that back down to where we want to be. And that really explains that.
Right, I'm going to show you now how, uh, how to plumb the depth using a stick float rig. First of all, you want yourself a decent plummet, a decent heavy plummet. I use these type with the cork underneath. And um, what I'll do is, because obviously this is set to depth at the moment, so I'm going to alter the depth and I'll just demonstrate to you how we do it. So that should be going below the surface. So all it is, we've got the weight of the plummet in your hand there, and uh, same thing as with the casting technique, bit of tension on the line, and then sweep it out into the middle of where you're going to fish, and then let it go down, and the stream's gonna take that float downstream, obviously. I've cast that in and we can't see the float, so that's telling me that we're too deep, uh, too shallow, should I say, set too shallow. So then it's a case of slide the float up, in this case it's six inches up, and we'll cast that in again. Let it hit the bottom, then let your line go slack and see if the float pops up. I don't know whether Chappie could see that, but I could. It was just below the surface, so we're getting close. And this technique works for rivers up to, up to the depth of your rod, really. So we've added a bit more onto that. Cast it out, hold the line tight, let it sink to the bottom, then let the line go slack. And we're still not quite deep enough, right. I've got a feeling this time we might be right. So I've moved it up again. I tend to move it up about four to six inches at a time when I'm getting close to where I want to be. Well, that just didn't quite break the surface. So just a bit more. Move that just an inch. So I think we might be just about right. There you go, it's just broken surface. So what I'll do now is I'll cast out again and I'll demonstrate to you how we sort of gauge how over depth we are. So we'll let the line go slack. see the float sat on the surface and it will slowly go under again it's dragging under so then we can lift up and you could see with the float there I've come in a bit closer in now so it might be a bit difficult to gauge that one we're not we're offline just broken the surface which tells us that we're pretty spot on with that probably about an inch over depth and what you do if you're fishing a bigger river you cast out and you'll find go to the far end of your swim and then just keep dragging that float across and dropping it back in the water and that will that's telling me that's a pretty flat even bottom there right across that river so now we are set to start fishing with that. That's the depth. Probably an inch over depth we are at the moment. So if I want to get that absolutely spot on, I'll move it down an inch. <clears throat> and there we go. And then I'll move that shot that we talked about earlier to the bottom. And that uh, sets my depth. What I tend to do as well, um, especially in match conditions, is I'll mark mark the rod to the top of the float. You'll see here where I've I've had it marked up before from a shallower swim we've been on. But uh, this case, I'm not going to do it just in this case. But that's how I'd normally mark it up, and that's just marked up with a bit of tipex. And that's how you plumb the depth. 
Right, we're back to fishing. We've we've just gone through all the plumbing and uh, I've told you how to pl plumb the depth absolutely spot on, but invariably we tend to set off at that depth and uh, you can usually catch fish at that depth or start catching fish early on at that depth. But uh, especially in deeper rivers, you know, five, six foot deep, and when you lose feeding, roach in particular, and dace, well, and chub, all, all fish move about in different depths of the water. So uh, you don't have to fish at that depth all the time. And I tend to uh, adjust my float depths and adjust the shot in as well throughout the day to try and find out where those fish are. Sometimes you'll run your float through and you'll keep getting little dips and pulls on the float and, uh, and then when the float settles, nothing. And those little dips and pulls will indicate to you that the fish are up in the water. So it's always worth shallowing up and when I shallow up, I tend to do it just two or three inches at a time and keep coming up and uh, eventually those little dips and pulls that you couldn't hit will turn into bites and that, that indicates the sort of depth that the fish will be at. Right, we'll just demonstrate feeding. What I tend to do, and especially on the rivers, shallow rivers like this, is we're doing the cast and we're casting downstream. So I rest the, uh, the rod in my rod rest and with a light car pulled, A, cast, uh, a catapult an amount of casters or maggots or hemp or whatever bait you're using directly on top of the float because we're only two and a half foot deep and then uh, that bait then is settling down as your float's running through the swim so you'll find you get uh, an ultimate catch area or an area where you get the bites and that's going to tell you where your bait's settling. This looks like it might all fish. Right, we've just gone out uh, for a little wander now. A mate's turned up. That's given me a good excuse to uh, leave the tackle. He's going to watch me tackle for me. And. Uh, I've just come to explore a few little swims that uh, take our fancy. We've just come round the corner from where we've been fishing and this, this peg looks like it might produce. Plenty of overhanging trees, a nice bit of float, that far side, let's see. Oh. <laughs> Got me a fish on. It came off though. But I fancy. Fancy this one.
awesome thing. The benefits of roving about. Little days. Says, oh, we're in again. Don't know what this is. Not a bad fish, though. <clears throat> Another chub. The benefits of roaming around and not staying too static. The reason I've chosen this swim as we've moved on is, uh, as you can see, where, where my float's going through now, you can see the bubbles along the water. That's where the main flow is. On the inside bank, it's quite shallow. It's gravelly, which tell, I always like to say gravel anyway. And uh, I'm assuming but because that's a cut there on the far bank, it's going to be quite deep, or deeper anyway, for as far as this goes. And, uh, and so it proved when I've put the float through, it's uh, quite a decent depth. It just actually, actually screams fish, as you'd say. It's what you call using your watercraft when you're out roaming about. You're looking, we've got a few trees, plenty of trees in fact, plenty of cover for fish food's going to get washed down in that bit of a current there on the far bank. I can put the float through great because the flow just it just goes with the flow it's perfect. Well, it's getting towards uh, low light now and uh, end of our session. As you see, we've uh, roamed right down to the bottom of this stretch. We're right next to the houses in town now. And uh, I was sort of hoping we could get a better chub here, but um, not had a bite yet. But it just shows you the different variant swims we can uh, find on little streams like this and rivers. We've got a footpath on the far bank, bridge over there and uh, I do know that the odd big chub has come out of this, maybe not this peg but this stretch. So we thought we'd end up here as the light started to fade 
and see if we can get one. Just goes to show, there's fish everywhere on this stretch. Well, there you go. I've had a really enjoyable day here on Codbeck at Thirsk. We've got a variety of species in that net. Dace, grayling, chub, from, uh, from a variety of swims, as you've seen. Unfortunately, we failed to get that big one at the end that we was after, but uh, we'll save that for another day. And thanks for watching. Right, let's have them back then. There you go, lovely catch. Brilliant stuff. <laughs>